senior product management for Sounds their good. discovery um, discovery solutions. And he's going to talk about um, how to um, learn useful things about uh, use <coughs> of their products out of uh, usage data. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, thank you for that. That and inviting me to come here to speak with you. This is my first ELAG, and it's a conference I've always wanted to come to, so I'm really excited to be here today. Um, my name is Andrew Nagy. I'm with uh, ProQuest Serial Solutions. Um, I'm the product manager for Summon, the discovery tool there. Uh, a couple of people have already asked me where I'm from, a, a Philadelphia, and, and where that's on the map, so I thought I'd show that. Uh, 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 the green one is where I live. Uh, the red one is where my office is, so I have a really killer commute. Uh, it's about a six-hour plane flight, so it's not something I like to do too often. Uh, but what I'm here to talk to you today is um, this, this problem that uh, project information literacy, how many people are familiar with project information literacy? Just, uh, just the two folks in the States, okay. Um, so for everybody else, it's, uh, it's a group in, in the US, uh, a couple of uh, library science professors um, where they kind of research uh, information literacy of different groups of people, undergraduates, um, faculty, researchers, uh, kind of uh, monitor behaviors, things like that. Um, they put out articles every few years, uh, so I'd encourage you to take a look at them. I, I'd hope that they're not geographically bound to just uh, characters of the, of the United States, but probably fairly common throughout, throughout the world, or at least the, uh, at the very least the English-speaking uh, countries. Uh, but I think this is really a telling tale here, um, something that, uh, you know, before I worked with uh, Serial Solutions, when I worked in a university library building technology, uh, something that we struggled with as well, and the reasons why we, we built some of the solutions that we did. Uh, I was a part of the, the Viewfind project in the early days, and, uh, you know, th this is really the problems that we were uh, facing is, is that, you know, users' expectations were uh, growing and changing and constantly evolving and not meeting up with uh, the tools that we were providing them. Um, and uh, the, the rest of the world was, was changing. Google and, and other tools, Wikipedia, um, was making things more easily for them to access these resources. If you think about uh, just what's happened recently, um, we launched the, uh, our discovery product uh, four years ago. Um, and if you think about what's changed from user expectations ever since we did that, uh, there's been a lot of change. The iPad didn't even exist uh, when we first rolled out our discovery tool. So you can only imagine uh, just the changes in the way users uh, expect things to work. And uh, the biggest problem that, that we've been facing uh, for probably 10 years at least is that uh, we're not meeting those users' expectations needs. It's, it's, a, it's a clear fact. Um, I think what's even more telling is uh, how much Google has changed recently. Um, uh, according to the folks at Google, uh, the, the UI itself and the experience has changed more than it has in the past uh, decade, uh, just, in, just in the past two years. Um, it's things like instant search, it's things like knowledge graph, all of these great things that they're doing, um, but the, the, the downfall for us is that we have to keep up with them. Uh, otherwise, our users are going to leave um, like they have been doing. We, we need to meet their users, the users' expectations in order to keep them. Uh, how many people here were building web pages in the 90s uh, and remember the notion of the seven second rule? Yeah, remember that? The, the idea that you had to have your web page load within seven seconds, otherwise users started to drop off? Yeah. Um, and then there was this thing called broadband and that changed the world. Uh, and then in the 2000s, uh, that rule changed to the two second rule. Um, if you didn't have a web page that loaded within two seconds, the chances of you losing users was pretty good. Microsoft Research put out an article uh, just towards the end of 2012 that they found that <clears throat> that rule has changed again uh, for our new decade. Uh, it's now the 250 millisecond rule. If your web page doesn't load within 250 milliseconds, they're gonna leave. Um, and you know, this is something that Microsoft Research, uh, something that I'm gonna trust. Uh, they've done a lot of research around this, um, and I feel pretty confident about what, what they're publishing. So you know, maybe it's not 250 milliseconds, but you know, they're really expecting things to be extremely quick. Uh, one of the big factors, I believe, there is uh, Google's instant search. 
you know, you get search results before you've even done typing. Uh, the next step is, you know, they're going to give you results before you've even typed anything because they're connected into your head. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of change, <clears throat> a lot of change going on um, that, that is uh, impacting our users, and we need to keep up with them in order to keep them engaged with our resources and our environment. And so what I'd like to talk to you today is about uh, a project that we did in 2012 to do a tremendous amount of analysis of not only our users um, uh, by doing one-on-one -on -one interviews, but also uh, um, analyzing all of the log data that we've been collecting since our product has been in, in production for a few years now. Um, and, and so what we wanted to do was, was focus on, on the users. Let, let's start there and see what, what we can learn from that. When we launched the product in the beginning of uh, uh, 2009, you know, it was a brand new product. We didn't have any user data. We didn't know um, uh, how users were going to react to this sort of thing. Um, but now we've been able to collect all that data and, and start to analyze it. So if, if, um, if you're reading any of the literature on the millennial generation, the current generation of users, um, they, they have a, a come. They have a, don't put it on a curved. Uh, they, have a, uh, a, they have a kind of a common set of traits. Um, I think one of the biggest things is, is that they don't really like to ask for, thank you. They don't really like to ask for help. They're very self-sufficient. Um, and they like to kind of work on their own. Uh, and so one of the things that we've noticed over the years is kind of a decrease in reference transactions at libraries because uh, users are, are more self-sustaining. Self Dave, be careful. <clears throat> um, but what I'd like to talk to you about is uh, some of the usability studies that we've done, um, some of the things that we've found. So um, the biggest thing that we've found, just by talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, Thank you. Is um, is that users start with their discovery uh, process? They start searching for resources uh, very early on. In uh, I'm sorry, they start with very broad searches. They start with just a few key terms. Um, and what they're doing is they're looking for um, other terms or other topic areas to expand their query by. Um, you see this happening all the time with Wikipedia. Students go right to Wikipedia and they scroll down to the bottom and they look for the citations. That's their starting point for their research process. They love to read the abstracts. They seem to be a little um, hesitant on clicking on things. Maybe they're a little shy. So they want to they wanna kind of read a little bit more about the item before they select it. Uh, so they love the abstracts. They love the snippets of the search results and the abstracts so that they feel much more comfortable that you know, this is something that really relates to what they're looking for. Um, with, with our product, we have uh, subject terms as a filter. Uh, and they found that to be extremely confusing. Uh, one, one student quoted uh, saying that, that they thought it was just a list of other students' searches. Um, why would I want to click on other students' searches? Um, but when we showed them uh, a list of disciplines that they can filter their search results by, they found that th that immediately connected with them. Now, I have to also caveat this, that uh, the research we've been doing with our one-on-one -on -one interviews has been with just students in the US. So um, there, there might be some differences in, in uh, other countries. Um, around disciplines and how that works, but that's something that we're very interested in learning more about. Okay, I'm gonna hope that this works. So here is, um, I, I have a couple of uh, quick video clips of some of our one-on-one -on -one interactions, uh, just to kind of uh, show you and make this presentation a little bit more fun. Beginning, like, I want this and I don't want this, typing it now is just like too much text, I'm overwhelmed. Can you hear that? Basically what she was saying is, um, there's too much text on the screen and it was extremely overwhelming for her. Um, really kind of talking about uh, necessarily the, the options, the filters on the left-hand side. Uh, it kind of, what we found is that users look at that and immediately get overwhelmed and they don't even want to explore it. It's too much. Here she is again talking about uh, the search results display. I guess I don't know if I need to know the authors necessarily on here. Like, so for me especially, like, I don't really care usually who writes the article, I care more about the content of the article when I'm using these resources. So, um, but it's really nice to have the title really big because that's what I look at first. 
So there's a couple of, of gems that you find in these one-on-one -on -one interviews, and I encourage you all to spend some time talking to your students. Um, but I'm not here to do you know, another usability session. I've never been to ELAG before, but I can imagine there's been other uh, you know, usability talks before on how to do it effectively and, and other things. Um, one last one, because I think this one was just a lot of fun. And when I click, I like that when I click on it, it opens in a new tab and not in the same window. That's easily the worst thing you could ever do in all time. Of all time, yes. Um, but there's some, so there's some really great gems in there, and I, I love watching uh, a librarian uh, interview a student and just be totally blown away with the responses. Uh, so definitely something that I encourage you to do and, and have, your, have your reference staff, have your librarians sit in and watch. You know, maybe um, uh, they could watch the recordings later or something like that. It was really, really valuable uh, stuff. Um, recently, the, uh, this was maybe about a year ago, the University of Konstanz in, in Germany, um, they, their library worked with their human-computer interaction um, department on campus, and they used uh, some of this really great hardware that they have and all of, the, um, you know, all of the expertise that they have on doing these sorts of usability studies. They did um, you know, facial recognition and eye tracking and monitored the students using, um, using Discovery uh, Summon and, and Discovery uh, and watching their experience and, and learning from that. And I, I took a little snippet from, from the report. Helen Luco is a graduate student who, who uh, ran the whole project there. And I think what she found is, is kind of the culmination of what I've been talking about is that um, you know, students are going to react negatively if you're not matching their expectations. If you provide them something that isn't what they're expecting, um, we've all seen this, right? They go to a single search box somewhere and they think it searches everything, they think it's Google, and uh, they don't even read the word library catalog, they don't even know what that means, uh, they don't understand the, the idea of boundaries and all these different things. They have these preconceived notions when they come to uh, resources. They expect it to search everything, they expect to get everything. Um, and when you don't match their expectations, uh, they, they uh, will criticize that. They will they'll get frustrated, they don't understand uh, why it works the way it does. So one of the things that we do in, in Summon, which is a clear um, breaking point for user expectations, is we have a little feature where you can save uh, items that you like. Uh, and the link for that collection is in the lower right-hand corner. It's the dumbest thing we've done, because in every website, it's always in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and so that's what this is kind of in uh, uh, talking about is, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you put that when, you know, every e-commerce website there is has the shopping cart in the upper right-hand corner. So uh, these, are, these are just some of the things, some, some of the, the norms uh, that, that need to be followed. Okay, as I was saying, my <clears throat> I won't break this one. Um, so I'm not here to talk about usability studies. Um, that is just one of the factors that you need to look at um, because they also have flaws. They're inherently flawed because when you ask a, a student to come into the library and I'm gonna give you a slice of pizza or a gift card or something like that um, and I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions, they're already immediately uncomfortable and in a situation that they, don't, that they aren't normally in. Um, they know that they're being tested, they stop and they think. Um, uh, how many people have read the Don't Make Me Think book by Steve Krug? You familiar with it? No, okay. It's a, um, I highly encourage you to take a look at, at this book. Um, the, the premise is that when users come to your environment, to your website, um, they're, they're not really thinking. Uh, they kind of explore and use the tool first and then think later. So uh, it's, a great, it's a great book on usability. I highly encourage you to, to, to take a look at that book. Um, um, and the problem with usability studies is they start thinking right away, which is not inherently um, natural. So the other, the other um, tool in, in my arsenal here, um, in terms of determining how I can make a better experience for my users, is actually looking at the raw data of how users in their natural environment are using the tool and exploring. And so that's where you know, big data comes into play, but, um, as uh, Dan was just mentioning, and, and I was reading an article last week about how the, the notion of big data is really overused, and big data is really, you know, big data, and if you're only working in the scale of gigabytes and terabytes, that's not really big. Big is really like petabytes and exabytes uh, of data. Um, so I'll call it big-ish data uh, that we're working with. Um, but I, I like to ask the question, <clears throat> so that everybody starts thinking about this, is, 
where is your data? How long are you keeping it around for? Um, are you mining your data? Are you doing anything with it? Are you just letting logs rotate in a directory somewhere and never ever look at it? Um, and, and really the idea of are, are you keeping data? I tried collecting log data, website log data from a number of universities. And after talking to their IT manager, I found that in many cases they delete their log data after a year or two years, six months. And that's just doing a clear disservice to yourself. So keep your data around. It's not expensive to store it. Um, it's, it's not that much data. Um, and uh, being able to look at the historical changes as you implement the change and being able to look before and after and kind of get an understanding uh, of, of what's going on is really, really valuable to know if, you've, if your change was right or wrong. Um, so what we've done is we've built, uh, I've heard already uh, mentioned uh, Elasticsearch a few times. We've, we've built a, an Elasticsearch uh, data warehouse where we're pumping all of our data into the system. And what's really great about Elasticsearch is it allows you to index data really, really quick. Um, it's, it's, it's nice, it's built on top of Lucene, so if you're not familiar with it, maybe you've probably heard of solar, kind of think, think in that vein in terms of technology. You can dump data into it. it, it uh, what's great about it is it, it reads things really fast. Um, it has some really great versioning and, and uh, dis uh, distributed uh, nature to it. So um, it, you know, it scales really well. Um, it, it handles lots of data and, and, and so that you don't have huge amounts of data loss if you're sending it too fast. So it's a really powerful solution. Um, it works really well for, for us at least. And, and we're look, working at a, at a pretty large scale. We're servicing over uh, 600 uh, institutions around the world. Um, we're dealing with millions of users on a daily basis. So uh, we've, we're able to log and, and work with this data pretty, uh, pretty well, and it works really well for us. Um, so, okay, uh, what I'd like to do is kind of talk about some of the, some of the data findings, um, which I think are interesting and beneficial. Um, so you see here a graph of the number of search terms used in a query. Um, it's a pretty sharp graph. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that graph into um, a logarithmic scale so you can kind of understand a little better. And um, so what you see is a, a, about, what's it, four, oh, I've got it right here. 45% of searches are three words or less. So we're dealing with a tremendous amount of searches, and, and the primary search is three words or less. The bar there is the 50% mark. So if I went back to the previous chart um, and, and had this line, it would be almost to the edge of the graph. So a, a very large percentage of these queries are, um, are just one, two, and three word queries. These are the very broad queries that I was talking about that we, that we found from the one-on-one -on -one interviews. And then there's this long tail. So I, I, I try to categorize uh, the queries into two categories. Um, one is the broad topical searching, and one is uh, more known item searching or more advanced searching. So we'll take a look at those in just a minute. Um, the other thing, and, and this is just one of the measurements that we use, which is abandonment rate. Abandonment rate is basically um, when a user does a search, uh, where did they click on the search? Did they click on anything at all? Did they click on the first one, the last one? Uh, that gives us a score, and we can use that as a success criteria. Um, there are a number of other um, uh, metrics that we use in evaluating this, and my colleagues are actually publishing an article uh, covering some of these more uh, in depth in uh, an upcoming issue of Code for Lib. So uh, take a look at, at that when it comes out. But what you see here is that uh, one word queries have the highest abandonment rate, two word queries, then, then three word queries, then you s sort of hit a hot spot there, a sweet spot of where users are having more success. So we know that users are really struggling with one and two word queries, yet that's you know, probably more than 50% uh, of the queries, um, or I'm sorry, more than 40% of the queries are one and two words uh, and three words. So, so we know that that's really where the struggle point is, and that tells us something like, well now we, we, should, we should help these, these users, we should try to address this. Here's clearly a, a problem uh, that we can do something better with. So if we look at what some of those search terms are, uh, these are some of our uh, most common search terms. Um, I'm going to say ProQuest, which is number two, and Global Warming, which is number five. Just ignore those because that's probably most likely my sales team just uh, showing examples. Um, but if you remove those, uh, the list continues on for quite a while of just these one and two word queries. 
And these are, you know, JSTOR is our, our number one top search term. A lot of uh, databases, a lot of basic things like global warming, uh, obesity, you know, and, and if students are starting with this, it really clearly identifies uh, some struggle points. And we need to help these users. Um, asking them to come to, um, well, it was, it was uh, Lucas with the brochures. We've got plenty of classes for you to come. You know, we're not gonna get them that way. We need to help them at the point of need. We need to help them through the process. Um, and so asking them to come to an information literacy course is not going to, uh, is not gonna uh, suffice. So here's some of the long tail search terms, and these are just random, uh, random things. Uh, the first few are, are kind of known item searching, so they're typing in the full title of, a, of an article or a book, something like that. Um, uh, others are uh, more advanced, I would say, where they've grouped a number of subject terms together. And so these are the ones that we know are having better success. So how do we get the users to this? And how do we get them to the things that are most important to them um, in, in this nature? Um, one of the things that we did uh, uh, addressing that exact idea was kind of uh, taking one from, again, web search, uh, meeting some of our users' expectations. Uh, they use Google every day, we know that, and they're familiar with the tools. And one of the things that we implemented was uh, what we call query suggestions. So when, when they enter in these one word, two word, and three word terms, what we're able to do is expand their query and add other subject terms to their query so that they can get more closely related to what they're looking for faster and kind of help them along through the process. So, <clears throat> so you can see that at the, that happens at the bottom of the search results very much like uh, a lot of the open web search engines, Google, Bing, Yahoo, uh, are all doing this. Um, another thing that we found is, you know, users are doing these searches for uh, databases. They're doing searches for the word library hours. Um, they're doing kind of these things where uh, content in the discovery tool might not cover what they're searching on because a lot of libraries are just putting the search box right front and center on the library's homepage. Uh, a quick anecdotal story, I was talking to a librarian a number of years ago. She said that they uh, put a feedback form on their library's website. It wasn't on the homepage, it was a few clicks in just to leave the feedback about the user experience or about the website, whatever. And uh, they said that the most common feedback that they got from users was user search terms. They, the user just sees an input box and thinks it's a search box. They completely ignore the fact that it says feedback across the top. They completely ignored that and they were putting in search terms. That was their most common feedback that they were getting. So again, when libraries put these search boxes on the library homepage, they're searching for everything. The user expectation is it's Google, it'll get me everything. So another thing that we did was um, we brought in uh, Best Bets, which is um, kind of a concept that's been around for a while and al allows us to, to put in those things where you know, the, the corpus of the index, which is more of the academic material, if, they, if a library wants to, to highlight something, um, uh, that way we can allow the user to connect right to uh, some of that material. So you can see here, a user did a search on uh, Singapore from the National University of Singapore Library, and they created this little, uh, this little tip. Um, okay, so a couple other things that we found. Um, I think this was an interesting one, something that needs a little bit more investigation, uh, but this kind of shows the number of users, um, or I'm sorry, the number of filters that are applied in a query throughout a session. So the first query had, um, on average, just a little bit more than uh, one filter applied. The second query, you can't even see it going up, but it, but it does a little bit. And then after about the third query, on average, users then start to engage in the, in the filters. So um, if you're looking at overall searches and looking at are, are your facets being used or not, is not the correct way to look at it. The correct way to look at it is, you know, what number of um, filters are being applied in the first query, the second query, because that, that's gonna give you a better understanding as to when and how are they being used. We know that um, they're being used kind of later in, the, later in the experience. So they start with a few words and then they apply the filters. Um, uh, here's a, an example of the number of queries in a session. So how many queries are there running in a session? Clearly just one query is a very common thing and that's not surprising. Uh, but then you can kind of see a slow long tail um, so that means that you know, we're really engaging users. Um, this could mean that they're not having success. This could mean that they're um, really, they are having a lot of success and they're using, uh, using the search uh, feature and they're coming back and, and using it over and over again to find lots of stuff. Um, uh, and here's just a last but not least kind of a data set that we looked at. Uh, and this is again in the logarithmic scale because 93% of our queries 
um, are in English, which is something that's, that's interesting uh, considering the global nature of, of our company and our product um, and, and being placed in lots of different countries where we know that uh, because most uh, academic publishing is happening in English nowadays, and so users are, are searching for that content in English. So this is something that's really interesting. Uh, and then uh, Swedish is the uh, second most common language. So um, that's the before. What I want to talk a little bit about is um, some of the other changes that we've been mating, uh, making and, and some, of the, um, some of the afters. So uh, this is our filters now. And as we heard from that student, really overwhelming. Lots of words really jammed up close together. And so I think, I think an easy, easy, obvious solution is um, a part of our redesign work that we're doing on that is we've put a lot of white space. We trimmed up the word usage, made it very uh, easy and convenient. And we really hope that this will be a lot less uh, overwhelming for, for students to use so that they're more easily drawn to it uh, and they want to engage with it and they want to explore it and get more value out of using the, the filters. Um, the next one, which I thought was really interesting, is uh, kind of the structure of our search results. Um, so you see here, this is the before, where the title is over the icon. And um, what we did is kind of lined it all up together. So you can see the user's eye had to start with the title, then shift over to find the metadata. It made it a lot more difficult to scan the results. Um, in, the, in the new one, in the new design, we put everything all in a, a straight line. So it makes it very easy for the user to scan the results. It was something that we found that users were really struggling on where to click. Um, so I talked about the, the, shopping, it's five cart idea, the shopping cart idea. Um, we moved that from the bottom of the screen to the top of the screen. I think that was really obvious. Um, and last but not least, and, and this is something that um, is going to be more of an experiment for us, where we're going to try it out and see, uh, see how users react to it, both from a data perspective as well from a, an interview perspective, is that we um, went, are going from a paging model to an infinite scroll model. We find a lot of users are starting to use uh, tablets and mobile devices and wanting to just scroll without having to worry about going through pages. Um, and so I uh, just wanted to find, show uh, an overall screenshot of how our designer, our design team has uh, reworked the, the interface. And I think I've run out of time, so maybe we have a minute for questions. Thank you. Well, any, any way we have maybe time? For, I forgot to give you. Right, um, <laughs> if if, if there are any questions.